today he'll be discussing with us uh, two very important topics uh, which will have far reaching impact on our educational scenario in future to come the first topic is on the right to education bill which is introduced in uh, on 1st april 2010 and the second one is uh, on foreign educa institu education institutions bill uh, which is introduced on 3rd may 2010 <coughs> we'll be uh, discussing with you for about 2 and a half uh, hours uh, lecture and then uh, followed by that half an hour discussion and question session this is uh, with uh, this introduction sir i request you to address the participants thank you good afternoon everyone and i am indeed very very grateful to professor rahman uh please uh, talk to you, talk and interact with you people uh coming from various parts of the country uh from the higher education sector so i am uh, and it's a very very short notice he has uh, made this possible for me to come here and uh, talk to you and very very grateful to professor rahman i am also very grateful to him for giving me giving a long introduction but when people give a long introduction i am really afraid the the hidden agenda is to say to tell the speaker that uh, mr gentleman be very careful people have high expectations and you should do really justice to the introduction so don't believe all that introduction but i'll try to do what i can on both the topics that are you know, slated for today's afternoon discussion uh as dr rehman has stated uh, these are the two in fact there are quite a few important major developments that are taking place in this case of education sector in india and uh, we take pick up two major major developments that have taken place uh one with respect to school education very specifically referring to elementary education and the other with respect to the higher education so first we focus on this uh, school education one elementary education one which is now uh, widely known as the right to education act that i'm sure everybody knows of it and i'll briefly refer to a little bit of the financing also towards the end of the presentation uh, essentially being my specialization in, uh, is largely on financing but i i try to cover the whole right to education act in a in a holistic perspective and the same i will try to do with respect to uh, the foreign education bill in the second session uh let me start with a couple of aspects of education that are very very important to note uh some of which we know well but some of which we tend to ignore if not forgetting particularly when we are uh, engaged in educational policy discourses or even educational research discourses and that's becoming very important nowadays uh, given the rapid uh, changes in socio economic policies in india and also in the rest of the world of course as i said some of these aspects are very very clear to many but let me list i think three or four aspects which are also much more relevant for elementary education even though they are also relevant for the education as a whole all levels of education education is considered as a public good and i'm sure uh, most of you know what is meant by a public good a public good which produces a large set of benefits for the whole society even when some people go for uh, go go and have that particular sector service or good the i mean in layman's language we call them social benefits in technical terms we call them externalities that is the benefits that flow to the whole society in addition to the individual who is going to the school or college these benefits are a lesion uh, and uh, they spread over all all areas of life social political economic cultural technological and what not i mean very very simple benefits like uh, the civic behavior of the people or the children who go to the school would matter a lot for the whole society the people who are educated uh, elect a good government and the whole society benefits including those who are uneducated or less educated etc etc 
So one can think of really a very large set of benefits, some of which could be quantified, and, but many of which cannot be easily quantified. And these externalities are very important in case of education. There are very, very few goods of this nature where there is a, such a large set of externalities which are also very widely spread without any control. I cannot really control the benefits uh, flowing from larger sections of the society. And that has a very, very serious implication for the whole policy, public policy. In the sense that when it is a public good, uh, the government has to see that the public goods are available to everybody. We, and the, and uh, the public goods are financed by the state because the whole society benefits, not just the students who are going to the schools, or not just the parents who are sending their children to the school. So it has a lot of implications for public policy in general and public financing of education in particular. And I'll come back to that particular one. And in case of elementary education, it is considered as a pure public good. Sorry, I made a mess. In case of elementary education, it's, con it's considered as a pure public good because the benefits are uh, flow almost equally across the whole society uh, without making a distinction between the student who goes to the school and who doesn't go to the school or the adults in the society, etc., etc. So we call it the pure public good. And government has an utmost responsibility with respect to pure public goods or a higher level of responsibility with respect to pure public goods. And that's the reason why, both in India and also outside, and not only now, even in the 1950 Constitution of India says it has to be provided free by the state to everyone. Because the whole society benefits and why cannot ask one particular individual students to pay for, the, uh, pay for this particular education. Education is also considered as a merit good. A merit good is one, again, similar to public good. One which is, uh, considered important by the state for the individual and also for the society. And even whether the individuals do not know, but in fact in many cases the individuals may not necessarily be knowing all the benefits from that particular sector. But the state as a collective agency, the society as a collective agency knows that it is good for the student and also good for the society. And hence, the state says that that must be provided to everybody. Not only must be provided to everybody, but everybody must have it. So we also make it compulsory. That's the reason why, in fact, we find compulsory education as an important provision in the Constitution of India in 1950 and also now reiterated much more strongly with the recent development, which I'll focus upon a little bit later. So the whole question of free education and the whole question of compulsory education have very strong theoretical and ethical basis, uh, which, uh, which help the United Nations, the UNESCO, etc., to formulate their policies, and which are also at the backbone of the Constitution of India, when it, has provide, when it has promised in 1950 to provide the elementary education to everybody free and compulsorily. Education is also considered as a basic need, uh, as one of the minimum needs in India, that everybody must be having it. And the state has a responsibility to see that everybody has, an ac acts, has access to these basic needs. In fact, we, we in India, uh, and the recently the Supreme Court, not very recently, in 1992, which forms the basis for today's uh, the act, has recognized this more, not just as a basic need, but more as a fundamental right. Uh, a fundamental right is one that everybody must be having it. And the fundamental right is, uh, fundamental rights are like a right to live is one of the fundamental rights. The Supreme Court in 1992 has stated that people have a right to live. And when we say people have a right to live, people have a right to live like people, like human beings. And that makes it, education makes the difference between the human beings and the non-human beings or animals. So when we say that people have a right to live, the Supreme Court's interpretation, was, which is considered as one of the best uh, interpretations in the constitutional history of the whole world, is uh, that the people's right to live means that people have a right to live like human beings. And it went further. And people have a right to live like human beings, not like slaves, but with the dignity. And you can have dignity only if people have some reasonably good amount of education that gives dignity to them. 
dignity which is associated with social status, dignity which is associated with economic status and many other dimensions of individual and personal life. And fundamental rights are also those rights, I think as per the legal definitions, that the government must provide questions, no, no questions asked. In the sense that the government cannot say that we don't have money to provide fundamental rights. And again, the legal definition is that if the government says a fundamental, we cannot provide fundamental rights because we don't have the money, the government has no authority to stay in power. In fact, this is, the, this is a clear definition of fundamental right that prevented the government of India uh, to differ and differ for a very long period to clearly recognize it as a fundamental right. Even after the 1992 Supreme Court judgment, it took nearly 10 years for the Constitution to recognize it and to amend the, amend the Constitution to make it a fundamental right. So in 2002, the 86th Amendment of the Constitution has very clearly stated that education is a fundamental right and that will be provided free and compulsory to every child. In a sense, that was a reiteration of the Article 45 of the Constitution, which stated in 1950 itself the same thing. But making it a fundamental right makes much more stronger. And it has quite a few important implications, which I'll, which I'll discuss. <coughs> so because of this particular four, in fact, there are a couple of others, but I'll confine to these four. The implication is that the state has to provide it to all. And state has to provide it free. And state has to provide it compulsorily. As an entitlement, as an individual right, individuals have a right to it, and you have to see that those rights are enjoyed by every individual, every citizen of the country. Let me also refer to a couple of other aspects relating to the nature of education and the role of education in development. I think it's very, very widely recognized for a very long period that education is important for development, individual development and also for national development. Education gives you jobs, education gives you earnings, education increases economic growth of the nations, etc. Education makes people productive, education gives, I mean, quite a few things that we know. Uh, and it's rec recognized as uh, a means for development, as an instrument for development. And in economics, it's also considered as a factor of production or a factor for growth. So the whole growth theory has changed after we recognize that education is an instrument, as an investment for uh, development. That has been there for quite some time. And whether the economists have stated this in 1960 or not, even before, I think we recognize that education is important for development. In the very recent years, when the human development thinking has started in 1990, uh, they have gone further. In fact, they have not gone further. They have stated, the stated something different. And I don't say the opposite even. The human development specialist, particularly Amatya Sen, the Indian Nobel economist, and also Mahabubul Haq, who was in UNDP, a Pakistani economist, came together to say that education is, is development. Education is the end. It is not just an instrument for development, but this is an end in itself. So you should not ask the question whether education benefits or not, whether education gives employment or not, whether what does education do? Because if people have ability to read and write and communicate, that, that, that itself reflects a higher quality of life, a higher level of development. Just as we say that people, have, people should be healthy, and nobody asks the question, why should I be healthy? The human development specialists argue that people should be educated. And uh, because that itself is good for him, that itself is that itself means development. An educated person is better, that is more developed than an uneducated person, irrespective of all other, all other aspects. <laughs> of course, Sain went further, Amartya Sain went further to say that it is one which is an important human capability to do everything, to think, to do, and it is considered as one of the freedoms, one of the important cherishable freedoms that must be provided. Now, we feel that, um, some people feel that there is a difference between the two. Uh, arguments that we made in the beginning that education is for development as argued by quite a few very very strongly and rightly and the human development specialists who argue that education is an end in itself education is development there is difference between the two as I said but they are not completely contradicted to each other and uh, some people found that it was contradictory but an important contribution of Sain was to say that it's not contradictory but they are mutually supplementary 
both roles are important both roles of education are important but the order is also important education constitutes development education is development that is the most important function of education and secondarily and secondarily only underlined that education leads to development individual development also which is called the instrumental role of education i think that's very very important to note it now when we speak about in the human rights context i think in fact saints work also helped in the in the in the development of the human rights literature to a very great extent uh, <coughs> human rights are recognized as those those which are obligations on the part of the government i'm fine uh, on the part of the government to fulfill these are important obligations and as i said the government cannot say that we in our society we don't respect these rights or we don't have the money to provide for it etc etc uh, or ours is a democratic society ours is a fundamental society ours is a uh, secular society it doesn't matter all those things are completely independent of this the human rights must be provided by every society uh, every uh, in, in by the every government in every society these rights are also these rights also apply to everybody without any kind of discrimination by of any category rich or poor etc etc and but a point that i forgot to tell you when i said it is compulsory and public uh, public good and a merit good it also means that when the state has to provide it free the two general principles that we talk about are not relevant with respect to education that people have ability to pay some people have money so why don't we ask some people to pay for it that is considered as an irrelevant argument as far as education is concerned similarly it's also argued that uh, people have a choice and people let them choose to have it or not to have it or to choose what kind they want to have it the public good and the merit good concept and along with the human rights makes it very clear that the choice is not important in fact there is no choice with respect to education you have to be that's it's a forced one that you must go to elementary schools you must send your child to the primary and upper primary schools it's there in almost all civilized societies whether they are effectively implementing it or not is a different question so you, you can't say that i don't like it or i don't want to send my child no it does there is no choice at all the choice principle doesn't help ideally speaking there is no choice between not only going to school and not going to school but also going to school a or school b it's only one quality school that's available to everybody that has to be provided so the human rights are also justiciable in the sense that individuals can fight for them can go to the courts and claim it and that's what is now started after education is made a fundamental right and it is not just one time a fire the provision of fundamental rights is a continuous affair that has to be that has to continue forever uh, ensure that everybody has it and as i said it applies to all kinds of countries politically different systems economically rich and poor whether people people or societies now <clears throat> let us come to what we are talking with respect to the indian system and indian right to education act it's no more a bill it was passed in the parliament in last december and made effective also from april i think april 2010 uh, with an act and i'll briefly comment upon that the that's also the difference why we wanted to make this uh, compared to the situation that we had in 1950 in the constitution of india that it essentially makes justiciable justiciable is one that the people can claim it people can challenge the government for not providing it in required quantum and required quality if you don't have a school nearby if you don't have a quality school if you don't have teachers going to the school you can go to the courts and demand for that it's also justiciable in terms of that it has to, uh, you have a right to free education you have a right to compulsory education you have a right to equitable quality education and as i said that's for all every individual in the society has it i think these are the couple of important aspects that were expected in the act uh, to make it very clear and some of which are made clear of course uh, in the bill now in india we recognize elementary education which includes primary and upper primary education classes 1 to 8 as as uh, the fundamental right that has to be provided as i said in the 1950 the constitution made this point but it has not recognized as a justiciable right it was provided as a directive principle which also which only says that the state may provide 
um, subject to the availability of resources, or the state shall try to provide, shall endeavor to provide, but it, there is no compulsion on the part of the government to provide uh, free and compulsory education to everyone. In fact, uh, critics argue that this lack, this uh, vagueness in the 1950 constitutional constitution, well, constitutional provision, was responsible for our very tardy progress uh, during the last 60 years. <laughs> that the government was not sincere, the government was not made sincere also to do this, etc. So despite the constitutional provision, the government was not serious because the legal provision was very weak. And as somebody said directive principles are not those effectively direct the government to do, but only request, make a plea to the government that they may provide it, etc., etc. And there is also a vagueness in terms of, the, it's not very clear what is meant by free education, and as a result, we had all distorted definitions of free education practice during the last 50 years. Like, uh, it, if it is called, if it is provided tuition fee free, that is considered as free education, which means that the schools were free to charge any kind of other fees. And schools did charge, even government schools, municipal schools, panchayat schools, not to speak of private aided, non aided schools, charged all kinds of other fees. And still, what is, what is considered as free education being provided because free tuition was not charged, but all other fees were charged. So there was no clear definition of free education. And once the Constitution has not provided for a clear definition, our administrators have made all kinds of interpretations. There was also a debate for a very long period in the 1950s how much, in fact, the 1950 constitution doesn't say whether it is eight years of education, 10 years of education, or five years of education. It only says up to the age of 14 or so, something of that kind. So people say that, okay, we can provide four years of education before child goes, to, before child becomes 14, and that would be the constitutional fulfillment of the constitutional directive. So there were debates whether to provide four years of primary education, five years of primary education, or seven or eight years of elementary education under the constitutional provision for a very long period. It is only in the fifth and sixth five-year plan periods there was some clarity that came up to the government, maybe because of international forces or otherwise, that that has to be clearly defined as eight years. There was also no clear definition of what do you mean by education. And as a result, we had uh, formal education, non-formal education, and all types of education considered as providing education. Uh, and uh, there is also no compulsion at all on the part of the government or on the part of the parents to send their children to the schools. Even though some states tried to make it compulsory by different kinds of actions, but did not do quite effectively. <clears throat> I think this is, uh, these are some of the reasons why I think the progress was very, very unsatisfactory. The 1992 Supreme Court judgment, as I said, is one which recognized for the first time or made it explicit. In fact, it says that if we are not making anything new at all, we are making the right interpretation of the Constitution. And it says that it's a fundamental right uh, that everybody has a right to free education until they complete 14 years of age. And it's not just a directive principle which can, uh, which may, can be ignored by the government, saying that there's no money or otherwise, but a fundamental and justiciable right. And I said it constitute, it, it flows from the more fundamental right, which is considered the right to live, right to live. So after the 1992 judgment, it took 10 years for the government to make the constitutional amendment and to make it very clear, because there is a danger in our country that even Supreme Court judgments could be changed. But then another, another judgment could completely undo the judgment that was given. So there was a huge demand for proper legislation, and the, finally the government has made a constitutional amendment of this kind, which stated that the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children uh, from, uh, from the age of 6 to 14 years even though there, is, there was still some vagueness, but it was promised that the vagueness would become clearer uh, in, the, in the subsequent act that was to come and that came in finally in 2009. Uh, the 86th Amendment to the Constitution in 2002 also included a fundamental duty, which is essentially makes it compulsory on the part of the citizens. So the compulsory education part is taken here, much more clearly saying that every parent or a guardian has a responsibility uh, to see that the children go to the schools, the children have the opportunities to go for school, go to the schools until they complete the 14 years of age. Not only until they complete, but from 6 to 14 for all 8 years of their life to have that. 
Now, some people really question why did we need the act when the constitution was there at all, but uh, we already noted that there was some vagueness in the whole constitutional provision. And uh, as a result, there was no strong uh, political commitment, and there are quite a few other, other aspects. No, this is almost a repetition that I did. Okay. So, finally, in 2009, we had this act, which makes, uh, I mean, which was said to be one which recognizes education as a right. But that's, a, that's an important point that I would like to underline throughout, whether the approach has changed or not so far after the act, after it has been enacted even. And a, a proper legislation was necessary, which was expected to be comprehensive, which was expected to be clear, uh, defining several terms with respect to free, compulsory education, etc., and quality of education, etc. And also really make it very tough for the government not to escape, and for the people also uh, to take it very, very seriously. That, uh, in fact, uh, the, the provision earlier was very, very weak with respect to this, making it compulsory on the part of the government or making it part of the uh, parents and children. And also it was expected that it will have a somewhat a long-term vision for development of education, which is also lacking in the present act, but that is, that's my last comment that I would like to make it later. So uh, let me take up these, I think I'll run to run through these several provisions with respect to what is meant by free education as mentioned, as defined in the act. And with my comments, what is meant by compulsory, what how education is defined, quality, duration, five years or eight years, access, providing access to this, and what are the kind of facilities that will be provided. In fact, quality is equated to provision of school facilities. And there is also a provision for private schools, which became quite controversial nowadays. Uh, okay. Now, what is this? Yeah, with respect to quality of infrastructure, it, re it referred to the training of teachers or trained teachers, and uh, it has some definitions about pupil teacher ratio saying that it has to be improved from 1 is to 40 to 1 is to 30 uh, gradually. And every, tra every teacher must have qualifications as prescribed by the National Council for Teacher Education. And that is uh, along with some infrastructure facilities. I think, yeah, yeah, along with some infrastructure facilities, is considered as the quality of education, not providing quality of education. Free education is defined as, in the, in the Act, as saying that there will be no fees of any kind, no capitation fees, in fact, or any kind of charges that the ch children will be compelled to pay uh, to the schools, or, for, or the parents to send their children to the schools. This is considered to be a much better uh, provision than what it was there earlier for a very long period, but that is still not sufficient. In fact, it could have been made that there is, uh, will be really free in terms of several kinds of incentives that the government is already providing, and governments are expected to provide in many other societies because that's all part of instructional costs that the students should uh, be provided with textbooks, provided uh, additional learning material, uh, incentives like uniforms, and also to the students, particularly of economically weaker sections who have opportunity cost uh, to pay for, to pay scholarships, because that would compensate for the money that they forego particularly when child labor is still prevalent. And we also have a known male program that is otherwise made universal now. But quite interestingly, the act does not refer to any of them at all. So if the government of India decides in the next year's budget to do away with any of them, we can do away without any problem. Because the act does not say that. The act only says that no fees will be charged of anything at all. And that is really a, a, a big, big weakness of the whole thing. There are quite a few other aspects also with respect to free education. But let me run through some of the main features and then go back uh, to some other aspects if there are questions. There are some compulsory education acts in uh, not only in other countries, but also in India, uh, some of which were enacted in, uh, in the pre-independent period. It's in Baroda or Kerala. Uh, but they are not uh, quite effective. Uh, and there are provisions for uh, making it compulsory and making fines, imposing fines on the parents for not sending their children to the schools, even sending them to jails for not sending the children to the schools, which is an important practice in many of the developed countries in the 19th century. But uh, we didn't 
really follow them very, very well. As a result, it is uh, neither on the governments nor on the parents, and there was no compulsory, compulsion at all. So we expected this to make it very compulsory. Now at least the act makes it compulsory that the government provides educational facilities everywhere. It says that every child will be provided and there is a responsibility of different levels of government to see that it is uh, compulsorily, compulsory admission is given to every child without asking any questions. And that is also a point I think nowadays you find in many uh, news media about how good is it to have admissions without any criteria of merit or something of that kind. And it says that it will be a school in every neighborhood. Uh, a state provided school would be provided, a state run school would be provided in every neighborhood. Uh, which is not very clearly defined, but which could be taken as almost like in every uh, every habitation or every village, a school without any discrimination, it will be provided. And we provide infrastructure facilities, uh, some of which are specified and many of which are not specified. And also provides for an elaborate mechanism of monitoring the system in terms of admission of these children, admission of the attendance, uh, monitoring of the attendance of the children, and until they complete the eight years of education. Uh, I, I think that's a very important provision that has been made in the Act. And in a sense, a good quality ed education is promised to every child. Uh, as I said, this is an important development in the whole, uh, in the whole Act compared to the earlier provisions that we have. The compulsion, some people say that there is no compulsion at all that was mentioned, but the compulsion was taken care by the fundamental duty which was made a part of the Constitution, but which is not coming into the Act. With respect to the quality of education, it refers to certain particular aspects and in terms of teachers or in terms of number of teachers per, every, per children, and the size of the classroom, size of the buildings, etc., etc., and uh, playgrounds, sports, and equipment, even though, as, as I said, some are loosely defined and some are not very clearly defined. Like, there is no definition what do you mean by play material, games, uh, sports equipment. There is no mention of what do you mean by library, how many books would be there, uh, or, or anything of that kind. A minimum number of working days is being provided, saying that they must work for something like 160 days uh, in a year. Um, yeah, there are many, many specifications which are, which are found to be missing in the whole one. What was debated during the last 10 years, in fact, 1992 to 2002, is uh, we defined something like a good quality of education, not only good quality, but also equitable quality of education. The government has conceded to, to refer to the concept of equitable quality in its several drafts that it has prepared but finally the term completely disappears in the final act. Uh, it was not, in fact, at one point of time, the government said it's very difficult to define what is meant by equitable quality, but we can say something like acceptable quality of education, even though we don't know who has, who's, for whom it is acceptable. At one point of time, the government also said uh, even acceptable quality is difficult to define. We should say something like tolerable level of quality of education because we have intolerable levels now, uh, something of that kind. Also, if we have a long-term vision and if we have a proper definition of neighborhood, uh, but not the kind that was mentioned in the Act, it would have led to something like a good common school system. Uh, a common school system where every child goes to a single type of school in the whole country, which teaches single type of values to the every child. That is what is done in most countries of the world, most developed countries of the world in the 18th, 19th, and even in the 28th centuries, when they were universalizing basic education. Uh, but we, we were not clear of how to provide it. Now the problems are different, of course. Now, um, <coughs> one thing is clear, again, it's, it's a better that it's clearly defined that it's six to 14 years of education. It's also very clearly defined that it's not four years, five years of education but it is clearly eight years of schooling that is to be provided free and compulsorily. But this is a time when, in fact, many countries of the world provide uh, uh, the whole school education free. 10 years of school education, 15 years, in fact, 12 years, 10 to 12 is very common in many developed countries of the world. And even some of the developing countries have nine to 12 years of schooling. Uh, and by defining the age group and also the uh, classes, I think, 
uh, there was a mess up. It was a mess up in the sense that if uh, the child uh, completes two years of education and by the time he reaches 14 and that's it. The only provision that was made is that uh, the children would be admitted uh, even without any conditions at a, in a class which would be relevant for them, appropriate for the age. So if a child who, is, who didn't go to the school at all, age 11, wants to go to the school today, he would put into grade 5 or 6 uh, without looking at other, other considerations. Um, and in other countries of the world, it's very, very clearly defined to cover the whole school education. And in fact, some countries provide not compulsorily, but at least free higher education. At least still a good number of countries exist that provide free higher education. But uh, we don't talk about anything of that kind. As I said, at least in quite a few countries, we have the age group of the child who is to compulsorily go to the schools that goes up to 18 years. 18 is also taken as minimum one because that's where we define as adults. Once they become 18, uh, then they can enter the labor market. In Indian system, we have prohibition against child labor until the age of 14 only. So to make it uh, compatible with the Anti-Child anti Labor Act, we made it uh, the Education Act also to 6 to 14, which is really uh, not completely justified. One of the important issues that was mentioned uh, much more strongly in the whole uh, act is, and which is also subject to a long criticism, is about the private education system. Uh, again, if you look at the constitutional provisions in many countries of the world for a very long period, there was no reference to private education at all. Uh, not only that, even now, uh, in many countries, uh, primary education or basic education is nearly completely state provided. Even in those countries which are otherwise regarded as market economies or considered as private societies with a lot of private individual choices, Including in those societies where higher education, there is a big private sector, but if you go to basic primary education or elementary education or even school education, it's nearly 99% to 100% completely provided by the state. So it's a state-run uh, education system in many, many countries of the world. But in India, we have, I think the current estimate is something like 20, 20 to 30% of our children are going to the private schools, which is said to be a very, very high alarming figure. If you want particularly something like equitable quality of education, education which uh, provides values uh, which is of not necessarily universal, but at least national in character, et cetera, et cetera. There are quite a few other problems, so I think we can, we can refer to that. We had different kinds of private schools, of course, you know very well. One is private aided schools, and I think that the term is really wrongly used because they are completely funded by the government. Or near funded by the government. Ninety-five percent of the expenditures of these schools are met by the government. So they should be called at least uh, government-supported schools or government-financed schools, but privately managed schools. And in principle, they also follow almost all rules of the government, all provisions of the government's rules and regulations. Uh, so quite a few people do not like the word to use private schools to refer them as private schools. Uh. Uh, only three countries uh, like Sri Lanka, Pakistan and uh, United Kingdom have the age 5 to 16 years compulsory education and uh, major countries they have not 6 to 16 uh, mentioned in the matter. Why they have fixed that uh, five, only three countries 5 to 16 other countries uh, <coughs> to... I do not know why those three countries are fixed from three, from five, but the... At least from a research point of view, there was some good research evidence which is nowadays not accepted extensively is uh, it is better to have a late entry into the schools. Late entry is not 15 years of age, but uh, it's a five, it is six. In fact, unless you complete six, you cannot get admission into some of the Scandinavian European countries which, which are said to be having excellent school education systems of a single, single nature, uniform nature and good quality. So, so by that time, the children's physical development and also mental development takes place, number one. And second, their natural development is allowed until they come to five or six. Otherwise, the schools also actually condition also quite a few types of development of the child's growth. 
So they, some, I mean, some countries really wish that, that I, I think even recently, very recently, the United Kingdom tried to make it um, a late entry, I don't remember six or seven, but not seven, I think. And it is prohibited to send a child before six. Uh, now, I don't say that is the view that is prevalent in our case, particularly when, we, when people are talking about why preschool is not included in the Compulsory Education Act. <laughs> Uh, but that could also be one of the important reasons uh, why it is restricted to certain certain age groups. But certainly, as I said, I do not have any idea why Pakistan has until five and India has from six. I gave one another reason why we made it 14 is because we try to make it uh, compatible with the Anti-Child Labor Act. So once the child completes 14, he can be employed according to our constitution. While in many other constitutions in Europe, they have to complete 18 years before they go to labor market. But so they also make it until 18. Uh, only two and a half years, two or three hours, three years, uh, three LKG, LKG system is there. The reason is not not developing the child, not... Uh, I, I'm not exactly commenting. Yeah, I'm commenting upon that particular aspect, even though I didn't refer to this particular uh, refer in the same way that you are saying it. Uh, but there are several other reasons. <coughs> now, uh, at least, as I said, some of the literature which showed that it's good to have child to develop, etc., was the literature of the European countries, which is not widely accepted in some other countries. But there are also other practical developments. I think, particularly compared to say. The 19th or 20th century or 1950s, 60s, women's labor force participation has increased. And once women's labor force participation have, have increased, the child bearing becomes a big problem. Child, yeah. Sir, so, free education. Sorry? Sir, free education has moved to the extent that even uh, books, shelter, as well as new uh, food is also available. But we need to be useful. For the girls, uh, they, will they will the students uh, cope in learning? Now these are two different issues. One is uh, I, I think I made a, uh, a reference to basic needs and uh, fundamental rights. Basic needs, food and shelter are considered the basic needs. Of course, education is also considered the basic need. Basic needs are those that the state has to see that you have access to them. You have access to them is different from the state has providing it. Uh, providing it free. So the state sees that nobody, I mean, state's responsibility is to see that nobody goes hungry, nobody goes starvation, and there is no starvation, death, etc. So you have, the, you have to have the food. Now, for some people, it can provide food free, or, it, uh, or for some people, it provides employment, and for some people, you and I purchase food uh, of whatever quality we want. Isn't it? But fundamental right, like education, is not something that has to be allowed to be purchased. The government has to provide it because of the characteristics that I said. It has a national value character, national value contribution that it has to make. Now, your question is, the second part of the question is, I think, is important. That is also a question that is being raised nowadays. Uh, children being admitted without looking at, without screening, I said, without looking at what the children can, uh, children's levels of abilities. And there are no examinations at all. Of course, exams were abolished in public schools long time back perhaps in 72 or 73 onwards. That's the reason why today people are getting increasingly concerned, people and the government is also increasingly concerned to know what the students learn, and we don't have any evidence to know what the students are learning. There is an automatic promotion in the school system, etc. But the point is, if there is no, if there is no monitoring of this academic, academic uh, performance of the students with whatever you call uh, examinations, internal assessment, uh, and improving the abilities really clearly with respect to uh, the learning levels, uh, there can be a danger. So some people very strongly argue, I think there is some, at least some element of truth in that, that this admission, I don't say free means not known without any price, but uh, unrestricted free entry without asking any qualifications, without looking at your uh, mental capabilities, etc., to give admission in grade six or grade five, may not be right. They may not be able to cope up with that. The only marginal provision that was made in the act is that you would be provided some bridge courses. So suppose you are already 11 years old and you didn't go to the school or you dropped out after grade two. 
So you will be provided three to four years of education in six months in a bridge course, and you are brought or you are expected to be brought to the level of grade six, and then you will be put into the grade six. Sir, what, what do you say? The government is removing A on private schools, sir. Whether it is true or false, if true, give me the reason. No, what, what is true? We have a large number of aided schools in the country, particularly at secondary level, but they are also there at primary and upper primary levels. Uh, after 1990, very clearly, after 86 and 1990, very clearly, the government in many states, I don't say generalize completely, but in many states, have an unwritten policy of not allowing the growth of aided schools. Because, as I said, the government has to fund 95% of the expenditure of these schools, uh, at least after two, three years. So the government is not in favor of allowing the growth of these schools. Uh, the governments have also frozen, or perhaps in some cases, some cases not necessarily not some schools, but some states have reduced their aid uh, to the schools. Uh, this is not necessarily with a view to reduce the number of private schools. This is essentially with a view to reduce the government expenditure on these private schools. So which resulted in the setting up of unaided schools in a large number. So you find a very terrific growth uh, in the unaided school, in the numbers of unaided schools in the last 15 years. Uh, compared, in fact, in the 80s, we have hardly uh, single digit to hundreds, uh, three digit figures at the national level with respect to private schools. Today we have uh, several thousands of those schools. But that, that is true with respect to college education also. The government wants to reduce its aid to the government, college, government uh, private aided colleges, what is known as private aided colleges, and not to set up any private aided college anymore. 